Hello everyone, my name is Rhys Kostinski. This is Simple Philosophy, where we simplify philosophers to help you better understand life. Today, we're going to be talking about liberalism. In today's video, we're going to be focusing on modern liberalism. Now, this video is going to be an extension on the video that I released last week, which was on classical liberalism, and we're going to be covering some of the same concepts from a modern liberal position. We're going to be looking at the modern liberal conception of the state of nature, individualism, the liberal economy, and the role of the state. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, as it will allow us to grow the channel. And without further ado, Let's get into it. I think before we get into the details of what modern liberalism ideology is, it's really important to understand why uh, liberal philosophy developed from classical liberalism into the modern liberal ideas that we're going to look at today. And in particular, this was due to the response of some liberals to the inequalities that had occurred within industrial societies, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, Classical liberals and all liberals hold dear the idea that all are born equal, so each individual should be allowed to flourish and achieve their own individuality. But the problem with the issues of industrialization and the issues of mass poverty that it produced was that many people didn't have the opportunity to achieve their individuality because they were quite simply too poor and living in fear. In Britain in particular, the government had a reluctance to intervene with the issues of poverty. Even though the poor law had been passed, many people found themselves either unemployed, in a workhouse, destitute, suffering from ill health and in cramped housing conditions. And for some liberals, this was an issue for the development of their individuality, because if you are impoverished, you cannot develop your individuality. And so therefore, this was an issue that they wanted to respond to and provide an answer to. Now, there's also another reason why liberal ideology developed, I'm going to argue, and that was due to the issue of liberal parties within uh, around the world and their response to the extension or demands to extend the franchise. I'm going to focus on the British case in particular here, but liberal parties had to respond to the changing social attitudes of a new electorate that was going to come forth. For example, in Britain, the representation of the People Act in 1918 gave all men 21 and above the right to vote. And this would introduce a mass of new people being able to express their political views and vote for certain parties. Previously, the state was just there to represent property owners as classical liberalism had, had uphold. Um, but here, the representation of the People Act would allow working class men to vote who were influenced by other ideas and had different interests to those who were owning property. Similarly, we also have uh, different gender groups, particularly women and women's rights, pushing for the right to vote and equal rights in society too. And by 1928 or the 1928 representation of the People's Act, women also achieved the same rights as men as long as they were 21 or above. And liberal parties had to respond to this changing demographic, which some liberals felt that the liberal party was not equipped to do. Similarly, working class people, different feminist movements, they were influenced by the rise of socialism and trade unionism, particularly, as I say, amongst working class individuals. The ideas of socialism, which promoted equality, which had answers to the issues of poverty, destitution and poor conditions, was more attractive to some members of the working class, as George Dangerfield argues, than the liberal policies of individualism that were perpetuated by the classic liberals. And so therefore, if the Liberal Party want to stay a relevant force within politics, they needed to respond and have answers to these issues. And this eventually leads to a split within British liberalism and the Liberal Party. We have new liberalism, which was spearheaded by Lloyd George, which I'm going to argue represent the key ideas of modern liberalism, particularly in relation to the welfare state. Um, Lloyd George developed these ideas in order to respond to these particular issues. You then had classical liberalism or old liberalism, which was spearheaded by Asquith, who David Lloyd George had removed. Um, and as a result of that, uh, he followed Gladstone's ideas of classical liberalism and they became bitter rivals and, and enemies uh, for the rest of their lives, essentially. But these represent the key splits within liberalism and why liberalism had to develop in order to appeal to a new world that the ideology was finding itself in. So I think the tenets of modern liberalism are best expressed by Herbert Samuel in this uh, quote from 1895, where he says that the role of liberalism is to enforce, wherever possible, such conditions of 
employment as the public conscious approves as just, to improve the surroundings of working class life, to render the resources of education equally available for the poor and the rich, to alleviate the miseries of unemployment and the destitution of the old. We can see here there's a far more socially conscious element to liberalism and hints of more intervention from the state and that would be seen as socially just. Same with the idea of social justice, we can read into this quote and these ideas as a result. So this is where we're going to pick up on and some of the ideas that we're going to discuss in the video today. So let's begin with the modern liberal conception of the state of nature. Now, remember, modern liberalism is developing from classical liberalism, that they share a lot of the same foundational ideas, but they come up with slightly different takes or interpretations on these foundational constructs. Modern liberals agree with Locke and this state of nature that humans are born equal, free and independent, that no one has the right to rule over another one and that the, in the central idea of liberalism should be the rights of the individual. Now, if we think back to Locke's state of nature, he had a rather optimistic view of people and human nature. He believed that people were nat naturally rational, that they always fell on logic, that there would be no need for the state to intervene or people to be told what to do because naturally we fall on our own rationality and we follow our own logic which leads to a harmonious relation in society. So therefore the need for regulation is extremely low. Now, modern liberals believe that this was, whilst they agree with the majority of what Locke was saying, they believe that this rationality was too optimistic. That in fact, even though we are naturally rational, this ration, natural need for rationality or our natural links to logic and that rationality need to be developed. And this comes from J.S. Mill in his book on liberty, which was published in 1859. Now, Mill is a classic liberal, but modern liberals are using this text or these ideas in order to develop their own ideas. So for Mill, he's arguing that individualism is an expression of what the individual can become, not what you are. So where classical liberals believe that we were already had our own individual, that we already had this capacity built within us, and so therefore no one needs to intervene in order to express our individualism. Mill was arguing that actually individualism is about what you can become, not what you are. So therefore, rationality needs to be developed. And he differentiates between the high pleasures of the mind, which would be education, and the low pleasures of the body, which would be things like gluttony or getting drunk. Building off this concept would be the idea that the state needs to intervene to promote equality of opportunity as a result, that people, we need to make sure that societies focus on what individuals can become and not rely on what people are. And Betty Friedman would be the ideal feminist modern liberal author to ex expand on these ideas. She argued that when human nature was left unchecked, uh, it had produced gender inequality, which had stopped women from achieving their individuality. So therefore, we need a state to intervene to protect our rights. There needs to be a growth in the role of the state to enhance our natural capabilities of rationality to make sure that individualism is promoted within the state and within society. Building off this idea comes the modern liberal conception of individualism. Regardless of whether you are a modern liberal or a classic liberal, individualism is the central idea of the philosophy and the individual always comes first. Everything always builds off this idea of individuality and individualism. So again, they agree with the idea that every individual is unique and equal. Therefore, freedom is essential to the development of each individual. And I think J.S. Mill, again, he's very quotable. Uh, J.S. Mill is another good quote that we can use here where he says, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. You are in control of your own body. No one else is and no one else should be. So therefore, that's essential to your freedom. You are individual, you are unique, and so that defines your freedom. Now, the problem with classical liberalism, as we'd already mentioned, is that it actually restricted certain people from achieving the egotistical individualism of classical liberals. Instead, modern liberals argue that we need to move towards a developmental type of individualism. T.H. Green, for example, argues that individuals are only free when they can improve and discover themselves. So, for example, through education, you can learn more about the world, you can understand more about other people, you can understand more about yourself. And through this process of individual self-discovery and individual need to improve yourself, 
you can actually create a better society and you are going to be a better individual and your freedom is protected. So this is quite different than the classical liberal conception of pursuing your own self-interest and freedom from other people. Instead, modern liberals are arguing that individualism should allow you to rise above your own self-interest and contribute to the common good. That actually, if everyone has a standard of education, if everyone understands each other, if everyone can build up some level of tolerance, society can become, uh, society can produce a common good. Society can come together in order to develop themselves and where they are living. This naturally links on to the modern liberal conceptions or idea of the state, where classical liberals argue the state should be limited and it should be about freedom from as opposed to freedom to. Modern liberals or the modern liberal state argue that the state should be an enabling state. So this means that the role of the state is to promote equality of opportunity as opposed to equality of outcome, that everyone should have the opportunity to succeed in life. Everyone should have the opportunity to better themselves. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to get the same results. So you, as long as everyone has had the opportunity to achieve, as long as you have all had the access to an even uh, playing field of a foundation of education, public housing, or the ideas that you are safe and have healthcare, then you are free to achieve your own individuality. However, not everyone is going to achieve that because we are not all given natural talents. And so as a result of that, it's about equality of opportunity, not the equality of outcome, where regardless of what you put in, you will be able to do that particular job or that particular role. So modern liberal state has a big focus on investing in public housing, investing in education and investing in healthcare. So things like universal education or free access to education, free access to healthcare, things like council housing in Britain are extremely important. A good way to think about this would be the case of uh, a psychological case, which is often used in teaching, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that if your certain needs are fulfilled for the student, that will then allow them to to focus and concentrate in lessons. You can think of the enabling state in a similar way, that as long as people have had these basic rights, these basic foundations given to them, then everyone can build off that, and then it's up to them whether they sink or swim. This links to the idea of meritocracy. So the idea is you would get certain jobs or you would rise to the top of society depending on your particular skills and talents, as opposed to maybe your mother or father giving you a job at their firm or people getting hereditary seats in the House of Lords. Instead, there is a bigger focus on equality of opportunity as opposed to having things due to who you are or who your family lineage is. Another concept of the enabling state is that the state is allowed to intervene in order to protect liberties or the liberties of individuals in society. So this is generally done through positive discrimination, that certain groups in society under uh, classical liberalism had actually not benefited from the rationality or the rationality, as Frieden has said, had never developed to the stage where people could self-regulate themselves. And instead, Positive discrimination needs to be enforced by the state to make up for these issues in society. So they always promote equal gender rights, equal rights for sexual orientation, equal rights for races and equal rights for religion. And in fact, if we think about how most people on the right or the left conceive of liberalism nowadays, they always think of it in uh, the sense of pursuing rights or pushing rights that by pushing rights or promoting rights, you create equality of opportunity as opposed to equality of outcome. All these rights do is they level the playing field. And so that's why many university campuses are arguing for uh, gender neutral toilets and things like that, because by doing that, it creates a foundational platform which each individual can then build off in order to promote their own individuality. So therefore, the role of the state or the state is allowed to intervene in these areas, provided it leads to the development of the individual. So the state can intervene in education, healthcare and housing, provided that it is justified by creating equality of opportunity. So each individual can flourish. Certain rights for certain groups can be protected through positive discrimination because they have previously been marginalised by society and everyone should have an even playing field in order to build off. Now, 
that you might think that seems a little bit in contradiction with classical liberal conceptions of individualism. And you could certainly argue to a certain extent it is. But the way these ideas are justified is through John Rawls' A Theory of Justice, which was published in 1971. Now, this is still an extremely influential text, particularly in universities for those people who were students in the 90s. And John Rawls is still someone who is discussed in political circles too, based on these concepts that he has developed. Now, in order to come up with a theory of justice or what social justice is, Rawls poses the questions, what terms of cooperation would free and equal citizens agree to under fair conditions? So what can we decide as citizens is fair conditions for everyone to develop these ideas of equality of opportunity. And he comes up with a thought experiment which builds on two concepts. So one is the original position and the other is the veil of ignorance. Now the original position, again, it's a thought experiment. So this is occurring within your mind and I would strongly encourage you to try this at home as we go along through the video. But essentially, the original position is that each citizen has an imaginary representative who will come to an agreement on the principles of justice. So it's not you in person. You have to kind of think there is a metaphysical version of you who is representing you at this table where society is trying to decide what is just and what is unjust. Each citizen is equal in the original position. So no one is rich, no one is poor, uh, no one has less social rights than anyone else. Everyone in this hypothetical scenario is equal. And so therefore they cannot use their powers to undermine others. They cannot use their position, for example, to ask for more rights for their particular group and gain more particular things for their, um, say, ethnicity, gender or, or whatever. Now, a good way to think of the original position or a good way of conceptualise it is think of yourself as an unborn baby in the womb. You have no understanding of what race is. You have no understanding of what the outside world is. You have no understanding of these issues of inequality, economy and wealth. You are thinking about you in this particular position and what society uh, you would want to be born into that everyone can agree on. So that Rawls would argue that there are certain fundamental rights that each of these people would want to agree on, such as universal health care, such as the right to housing, such as the right to jobs. All of these various different things are part of the original position and form the concept of justice. Now, there is an additional position in the original position that Rawls develops, which he calls the veil of ignorance. So whilst you are thinking about yourself in the original position or as this unborn baby in the room, you have to think about what you know and what you don't know whilst you are in there. So Rawls is saying that each citizen that's in the original position does not know anything of race, gender, class, economy, hierarchies, and all of these different things. So you are covered by a veil of ignorance. So whilst you're in the original position, you are covered by a veil of ignorance, which will then allow you to think along just lines. That said, he also said that citizens in the original position do know that citizens have different life plans, they want to achieve different things based on their individuality, that there is moderate scarcity in society, that not everyone will have as many resources as each other, but we can provide people with a basic standard of living, and there is an acceptance of basic science, such as the laws of physics and things like that. So therefore, this veil of ignorance means that you are putting aside all of your biases, all of your conscious and unconscious biases, and you are trying to create a just state as a result of that. And as, as a result, what comes out of this is ideas of equality of opportunity and what foundational rights people should be entitled to. The final area that we need to look at in relation to modern liberalism is the economy. Now, much like, I mean, I can imagine some people watching the video thinking, hmm, this modern liberalism sounds a lot like socialism. Not really. Whilst you can see some kind of correlations, it is completely different in terms of what they are trying to achieve. For a start, modern liberals are focusing on the individual. And in terms of the economy, modern liberals are still in favour of capitalism or a capitalistic system. And they, but the difference between classical and modern liberals is that modern liberals argued that free market capitalism creates social and economic obstacles to individuals attempting to achieve their full potential. So whilst classical liberals argued that free market capitalism was the best for individuals to achieve their individuality and use their rationality, 
Modern liberals are arguing that actually unregulated free market capitalism, so they're still in favour of capitalism, but unregulated free market capitalism leads to too much inequality within society, which then restricts people from achieving their individuality and developing themselves as individuals and therefore cannot contribute to society when modern liberals believe they should have the right to do so. Now, the key ideas of modern liberal economics comes from John Maynard Keynes, who kind of flips the idea of classical liberal economics. If we remember in the last lecture, uh, Say argued that supply creates its own demand, whereas John Maynard Keynes is flipping that idea and saying that, in fact, it is demand, not supply, that creates employment. So people have to demand the product in order to be in order for it to be supplied. So therefore, if there is high demand for cars, then that means we need more car factories to be open, which would then create employment. He also argues that free markets had failed to tackle the issue of unemployment. And here he's talking about it in the context of the Great Depression in the 1930s, that it led to such huge mass unemployment that the free market failed to tackle, which led to unreasonable amounts of inequality for modern liberals that the state needed to intervene in order to tackle it. And by, and by doing that, it will introduce tax and spend policies to spend on public infrastructure. So by taxing businesses or having a certain rate of tax and then spending it on things like hospitals, housing and healthcare, this will allow in each individuals to develop their individuality. And so the economy is matching that particular idea. So he also believed that the government should be free to intervene to tackle obscene unemployment. So just remember that uh, in order for capitalism to function, you do need a certain level of um, uh, unemployment for it to function, because that way you can push down wages and it creates competition within the labour market. So by full employment, they do not mean full communism where every single person is employed. They mean uh, employment to be at around maybe 80, 90 percent or so. So therefore, government should have the right to tackle unemployment by maybe nationalising industries or building industries of their own in order to employ more people, providing the demand is there. He also argues that employers will still make profit by employing all available workers, providing that workers work below the range of commodities. As soon as workers start demanding more than the commodities they are making, then this system is going to collapse. So again, there's almost a natural harmony within Keynes that needs to be taken a look at. But we can see how Keynes's core ideas reflect those modern liberal assumptions of individualism in a modern liberal human nature and the development of justice. But what do you think about modern liberalism? Do you agree with them? Do you think modern liberalism makes more sense than classical liberalism? Let me know down below in the comments. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next video.